Betsy Horvath has long believed Mark Redwine killed his son, Dylan. Absolutely. Why do you say that? Because it is violent. She too was involved in a custody dispute with him. They had two kids together. According to this indictment, he told Horvath that he would kill the kids before he let her have them. I didn't let him have the kids. Mark Redwine was arrested more than four and a half years after his son Dylan disappeared. The 13-year-old was last seen alive November 2012 during a court-ordered visit with his dad. The following year, some of his remains were found just eight miles from his father's home. At the time, Mr. Redwine told Denver 7 by phone he wanted to know where Dylan's remains were found so he could be close to his son. It's hard for them to describe to me the exact location that they found these remains. I've asked uh, members of law enforcement to stop by and uh, I want to talk to them about going to the location so I could be close to my son. But the indictment reveals a subsequent search found Dylan's blood in multiple locations at Mark's home. A police dog detected a cadaver scent in Redwine's living room and his washing machine. Dylan's skull was found in November of 2015, just one and a half miles away. It had injuries consistent with blunt force trauma. My greatest hope is that Dylan gets justice. Betsy Horvath says the arrest is just the beginning of a long road ahead, and her heart breaks for Dylan's mom and brother. The, the scariest part is it could have been my child. Joining us now to talk more about this case is Denver, Colorado-based criminal defense attorney Jeffrey Wolf. Jeffrey, good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. This is uh, one of those cases that uh, is really um, a heartbreaker. You have a 13-year-old who first goes missing, then ends up dead, and then dad is uh, arrested, but not right away. Four years passes here, four and a half years. What does that tell you about the strength of the state's case? It's hard to know what it says. This was definitely a case that, you know, had headlines here in Colorado for years and years. It would just seem to come back up from time to time. And, you know, it's a smaller jurisdiction down there. It's La Plata County. It's not one of our large metropolitan jurisdictions here in Colorado, of which there are many. And as a result, I think what we're seeing is they needed to bring in outside resources. They needed to do a lot of forensics. And you're starting to hear a little bit more through these indictments and through the case itself, a little bit more about just how much they've had to do and how extensive of a search they had to do. You can see in the video that's playing right now, that's the kind of country we're talking about. We're talking about a mountainous wilderness area. And this was not an easy thing. The reservoir where they found part of the body was searched multiple times before they actually found it with you know scuba with sonar this was not an easy case to make any charges on whatsoever much less the ones that they ended up making yeah and it is amazing that um they kept at it they kept trying to find more um and you know they end up finding his the little boy's skull you know teenage boy's skull um, a, a considerable amount of time after they found other body parts and this was a, a mile and a half from his home the fact that the boy was found close to his home to me doesn't stand out as very good evidence because he was staying at his father's home um, and he went missing so the, it would make sense that he would be found his remains would be found around the house um, what stands out to you as the most compelling thing the state has I think the most compelling thing that the state has in this case is the blood evidence from the home itself. Because you're right, the fact that they found the body near the home doesn't really say a lot. Uh, Mr. Redwine's story from day one was that the kid went to go meet up with a friend who lived about six miles away, which in a rural jurisdiction like this would not be surprising whatsoever. And so ultimately what we have is the blood in the house. That shows that something happened in that house whether it was the murder of this young man or whether it was some other altercation with his father. It sounds like they didn't have the best relationship. He didn't want to go spend time with him. He didn't want to be there that time. It was court ordered. And so I think that the stuff in the house, because they, they never really tell us everything in these initial filings. When this case ultimately goes to trial, I think that's when we'll hear what do they actually have? Because a sister jurisdiction just down the road from La Plata County 
did a case like this similarly where it was a long time and the fiance had been missing and eventually at the trial it became clear that they had a lot more evidence from that house than they ever let on and that led to a conviction and that might be the case here. Yeah, we just don't know the extent of the evidence, but what we do know is that it took four and a half years for them to make an arrest. So the evidence, um, for whatever reason, came in slowly and in different, um, you know, at different times, and then together, collectively, prosecutors said, all right, we have enough. Let's go ahead with this. How much, um, when you're defending a client like this, how much of attacking the investigation, attacking the science is going, is typically a part of it. And again, we don't know all of what is there to attack, but what we, you know, what we know is there seems to be, there could be a window there because of the length of time, et cetera, that that might be an avenue for the defense. Yeah, absolutely. The amount of time that an investigation takes is always going to end up being relevant because if it's so obvious that a jury should come back guilty here, why wasn't it so obvious to law enforcement for four and a half years? What is the possibility of spoilation of some of this physical evidence that they're dealing with? What is the possibility of contamination of the home or anything else? And there were a lot of people who wanted him charged with this crime, especially, namely, his ex-wife, the mother of this child. And he was not in the state of Colorado when he was arrested. Who had access to his home? What could have happened? What took so long? And why did things suddenly pop up if that's in fact what happened? Because, you know, she makes a plea for hikers and hunters to help search for her son. Shortly thereafter, that's when his skull is found on a hiking trail by a hiker. And so a lot of coincidences happen. And as a defense attorney, coincidences don't exist. There's a reason that coincidences happen, and there are explanations for coincidences that can lead to a good defense in a case and that can lead to the Colorado State Public Defender's Office having a very good case to make here. Now, there's another thing that I'm sure the defense doesn't want in is the relationship information, the story that a jury would hear that, oh, he was bad dad and child didn't like it going there. He was mean. That type of um, narrative can really hurt the defense in a case like this. Absolutely. And I think it's what ended up making everything point to him, even though he was the one who makes the initial call that the kid is missing and that they didn't know a whole heck of a lot about this family for a while. They were always kind of looking at him. And the mother was always saying, look at him. He's the one that did this. She went on Dr. Phil with him to point the finger at him. And so, you know, the relationship that they had and the, the evidentiary issues that are going to come up as far as, you know, some of the stuff that you guys were just talking about with 404B, is that stuff going to come in? Are they going to try and say we have evidence that he abused him in the past or Dylan was saying dad hits me when I'm there or whatever it is? Is that stuff going to come in or is it going to be impermissible character evidence looking to do propensity and the you know increasing cycle of violence that ultimately leads to the death? And that's going to be a big fight mm -hmm. for the defense in this case is to try and keep that stuff out. Absolutely. All right, Jeffrey Wolf, criminal defense attorney in uh, the Denver area. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for your insights on this. This is one of those cases that we're absolutely watching. It's on our docket here at Court TV Colorado versus Mark Redwine. Right now, here's what it is. There's a pretrial conference on the 8th of October, trial date tentatively set for October 28th. This has been pushed back numerous times. Both sides seem to want this to go, especially the judge and the prosecution. We'll see if it actually does um, one that we are watching.